beyond autonomous vehicles using AI for facial and object recognition from any camera. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Brent Buchestein, co-founder and CEO of Ventra Inc. Welcome, Brent. Hi, Tanya. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. What does Ventra do, and what prompted you to start the company? So Ventra helps companies make sense of uh, overwhelming amounts of security video footage that they have. And uh, we do that using proprietary deep learning algorithms. Uh, what prompted me to start the company was I spent a number of years helping build another company that put sensor networks into buildings. And uh, we were digitizing the physical environment, uh, helping companies figure out how their space was being used and energy consumption. And uh, this kind of Cambrian moment came along where uh, cameras started to go everywhere. And we had new ways using deep learning to interpret and make sense of the video coming off those cameras. And uh, it seemed like the right time to apply that technology to what is the, really the biggest of big data problems, which is 30 frames a second coming off a security camera that, um, you know, frankly has really meaningful impacts to an organization if they miss something that might be happening in that scene or they have to go back and find something and it takes them a long time to do that in a security situation. Um, so that, that was kind of the context. And then I was actually talking as well to a friend who worked at the CHP and he was telling me this story about, it was a terrible story about a child that had, that had been run over and uh, on a hit and run accident. And the, the big thing that was keeping them from solving the case was the dozens of hours of video they had to go through, through the town to track this person who was driving the car. So I've got two young kids and it was just kind of unfathomable to me to live in a world where the data was there to solve the case. And the problem was how do you create technology that allowed them to quickly go through video and say, I need to see everywhere where there was a white sedan that had these type of characteristics that was heading east across my entire city for the last three hours and across dozens of cameras. That literally was the reason why, you know, there was a mom sitting on the couch and she was unable to get answers about what had happened to her son. And that seemed like a great way to spend my thirties, uh, helping solve that problem. In the short history of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. as it's applied to video surveillance, what's been the standard methods of training the AI to recognize those faces or objects to be able to, to do the kind of work that you did? Yeah, so there's been kind of two approaches and, and we've, I'll tell you the standard one and then a different one that we've taken. So most organizations use uh, off the shelf algorithms. So popular ones are called uh, YOLO V3 or single shot detection. These are called SSD. And these algorithms were built for the autonomous driving industry primarily. And um, it's challenging to take those algorithms and apply them to the security field, which isn't all autonomous driving footage. It has fixed footage, mobile phone footage, drone footage, cameras that go right and left and cameras that go up and down. Um, so those algorithms really weren't built for purpose. And a lot of firms that, uh, you know, sort of slap AI on their name are using these kind of off the shelf algorithms. It's very similar. I'm a baseball fan, Tanya. So it's similar if I was like, putting on a, a Clayton Kershaw jersey, who's my favorite baseball player, and, and calling myself a Cy Young Award winner. Like, that, it's just not true. I, I can't do that. So we decided to take a different path. And from the ground up, we built our own kind of convolu convolutional neural network architectures. We sourced our own training data, um, using some publicly available to, to do a little bit of bootstrapping. But we've worked with a, a significant amount of customers to go and build our own training data sets up that are actually representative, not using um, like an open CV or a kitty data set, but actually from 480p footage bouncing off of a liquor store in the snow somewhere, that's the kind of stuff that our customers uh, need. The technology has to be able to work on that, um, not sterling 1080p HD dash cam footage coming off of, uh, you know, some autonomous test vehicle. So we've taken a, a very different path and uh, it shows up in the speed and accuracy numbers that our technology works at, which tends to run today twice as fast uh, at a higher degree of accuracy than like SSD or YOLO V3. 
many companies have, they tout open source as a benefit to using their solutions. Yeah. Why is Ventra chosen to take the proprietary um, algorithm path? Yeah, a couple a couple reasons. So one was, as I described earlier, which is along the lines of training data, right? Um, when you When you take an open source algorithm and just try to tune the last couple layers, um, it, it's problematic if the previous layers of that neural network aren't properly constructed for the use case. And, and again, most of them were built for the autonomous driving use case, not for some of the use cases that we see, fixed cameras, very dynamic um, uh, conditions that have to work across camera types. That's kind of reason one. Reason two we see coming out in the news, uh, if you go if you're using an open source algorithm, we think it's a lot easier to spoof that algorithm, right? And um, uh, use sort of uh, challenging or, or trick the algorithm, so to speak. You've seen companies come out and doing research, right? By putting a sticker or doing this certain thing on a face or an object, you can fool the algorithm. And the reason they can do that is because they can get into the layers of that neural network, right? It's open, everyone knows what it is. And so for our customers, it's important that that is locked down. And we are working on um, both a number of ways to kind of secure the neural network itself so that if customers even got into um, a situation where they had a cyber threat and our technology was part of that cyber threat, that we would be able to uh, protect sort of how the algorithm works. And that we found that to be kind of a compelling case for a lot of customers because it's much harder to um, you know, spoof something. The city of San Francisco banned use of facial recognition by city government agencies. Yeah. As, a, as a player in the person identification industry, what are your thoughts on how this will affect the development of the technology? And, and do you see cities moving to uh, join this trend? Yeah. So you know, it's interesting uh, what they chose to do there. I mean, there was two, first of all, kind of there's we think there's kind of facts, opinion, and fear uh, in this conversation. And I think that discussion or that decision was made somewhere in the opinion to fear spectrum. Um, there was really two studies that fueled uh, the decision to do that. And one of them, um, in terms of the, the AWS recognition study that's often touted, um, you know, I, I think AWS has responded to that about what uh, – what they feel was an inappropriate use of their technology and a not fit for purpose use. So I'll, I'll leave their statement to be as is, but it's interesting that that fueled some of the discussion. The other discussions around like uh, gender or, or skin tone mischaracterizations from an MIT Media Lab study, you know, two and a half years ago, uh, which as you know, is, is kind of light years um, in, uh, in this industry. And I think a lot of the players have made significant moves to improve their technology, us included. And we do things specifically on a quarter, whether it is uh, increasing the skin tone distribution on an area where we might see underperformance, for example, uh, to try to bring up the performance and accuracy of the system. So I think that was an unfortunate decision early on, but we have to also keep in mind, uh, part of the pushback against that was uh, the institution of, of maybe public safety itself and who might be using the technology and some of the uh, both well-founded and perhaps misfounded uh, trust issues, right, that exist within law enforcement. And again, some of them very well-founded. That being said, uh, we think a smarter approach would have been, uh, what, and what we've advocated for is, look, let's agree, let's agree as a community and as a society of stakeholders on a set of scenarios that this kind of technology makes sense to use in. So let me give you a sense, Tanya, for like for what they're losing. Uh, we we work with you know companies and other organizations that use this on a regular basis. And um, you know my three year old go my three year old daughter goes missing in the subway or the the BART station. Like I would sure love to be able to send the police a picture of her and say, look, this guy took her or she is missing. And the police now say, hey, our, our hands are tied. Like, what was she wearing? We can do some attribute-based searches, some appearance-based searches, but the fact she walked right by that camera in a scenario, um, that's, that use case is gone now. The use case of, um, uh, hey, we're, we're, this woman is being sex trafficked and her videos are appearing online and I now cannot search for her face on these videos that have been sent to us where we've come into possession because we made another arrest. 
I can't use that technology anymore. So there's been a lot of talk about what we're losing by using FaceRec, and I don't think there's been enough talk about um, you know what well, what we're losing by using by not using it. Frankly, um, so yeah, we think it's an unfortunate decision. Uh, we think there should have been an agreed upon use set of use cases. Like, hey, if we have missing kids, sex trafficking, active shooter. Uh, active terrorist threat, like let's agree as a community that we're gonna turn this technology on, use it in those scenarios, report on how it was used, look at the impact on who was, uh, who was stopped, who was inconvenienced by, by being stopped, and then let's agree as a society that that is worth it or not worth it. But um, I, I, in some ways, I think we've sent a bit of a message in that community that, hey, we may not be uh, as concerned with public safety in other places. So our view on it is uh, the, 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 we love research that is uh, both builds trust in the general space and builds specific trust in ours. That's why, you know, for customers, we've been very upfront about if you want to look at our performance, whether it's on specific objects or scenarios, we publish uh, data for them on uh, against kitty data sets, right? That are kind of open and very <clears throat> typical. Uh, we also have a, uh, our own internal data set that we consider to be much more relevant to what the real world conditions are. So yeah, um, I don't think it's gonna stop uh, the, the development of the technology. I wish we would have um, maybe taken a little more thoughtful approach. I completely understand and I think you're on the right track. Uh, Brent Buchenstein, co-founder and CEO of Ventura Inc. If somebody wants to connect with you, how can they do that? Uh, well, you can get in touch with us at Ventra, V-I-N-T-R-A dot I-O or I'm at LinkedIn at Brent Buchenstein. We'd love to connect with you there. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.